going back here. The cops ain't likely to catch up with us, not tonight. So we can all be quiet and peaceable and listen to the music. It's time to turn off that. And it's time to turn up the volume and listen to Auto Dealer Live. Repeat after me. Auto Dealer Live. We're live. We're live, and it is Thursday, and uh, we're excited about this show, man. This is the most anticipated show of 2014, and uh, we're ready. I'm ready to bring this thing, man. I got my referee shirt on. Cribs, <laughs> man, you can't see it, man. Give us, give us a oh, little chest. Give a little chest. Give us a little chest. Okay. We my are, wife told me not to do that. Not to do that? Yeah. <laughs> well, we are live, and we are excited, and we're pumped, and we're ready. We're going we're gonna to jump right into what's going on today. Because this is all the talk on Twitter. Um, listen, uh, digital dealers going on, but you know what? I, I I know people that are sitting at digital dealer and watching this, so I'm excited about this debate and what it's going to bring and what it means for the automotive industry. Dave, I know you're excited about this, and we've spent a lot of time preparing for this. Absolutely. I mean, we've been waiting with bated breath for this event, and you know, the thing about today is that everybody wins. Yeah. The whole entire auto industry wins, and in my opinion, no matter what happens at the end of the day, both of our competitors win. And I really, I really, man, I, th- I, I have a lot of respect for them for mm-hmm. stepping up to the plate and putting themselves out there for, for our whole audience. Yeah, absolutely. There's been a lot of banter, a lot of talk, and, you know, and, and obviously, as, as such can expect, I mean, really, honestly, we set this up, you know, weeks ago, and, and when you do something like that, the competitive juices just by nature that these two uh, gentlemen have is, you know, which also is the reason they're successful absolutely. in their own right. They're, they're type A personalities. You absolutely. Know, driven. That comes immediately to the top, and if anybody that's listening, understand, you understand this, if you're competitive, you're a winner, if you're, you know, if you're, if you're a type A personality, then you know what I'm talking about. You're they're waiting with bated breath and I want to jump right out and say follow us at Auto Dealer Live and today we're going to use a couple of hashtags we're going to use hashtag Thrilla with the Villa thrilla that's Thrilla T H R I L L A with the Villa V I L L A we're going to use hashtag Auto Dealer Live and I want you to tweet us here's what we're going to do um, we're going to throw this out we've got uh, this book I, it's a phenomenal book uh, we bought some of these for a future show but I'm going to go ahead and, and, and give one out we've uh, you know everyone obviously that's listening knows who the great Grant Cardone is shout out to Grant Cardone Grant's uh, been a guest on this show we love Grant um, he has a book that is absolutely blowing it out of the box 10x and we're going to give one of these out to whoever 10x's their tweet their tweets during this show i want you to tweet the freaking daylights out of everything that's going on and whoever that is at the end is going to get this autographed copy of the 10x rule um so cribs man in a few minutes we're going to bring on alan we're going to bring on sean and you know what do you expect today man what do you expect when it's all over you know, I, I don't know. I've, you know, I've played it out so many times in my head, and it looks different every time. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I think that, if I'm not mistaken, we have two fundamentally different approaches. And I, and I don't know. I, I don't think that necessarily either one of them will be wrong. You know, uh, I think it's, uh, it's going to come down to whoever can, you know, bring... You're being a little politically correct, well, man. Well, I, I guess I am. I mean, I don't know. I'm a little confused, man. I guess I'll know at the end of the show. You know, okay. And, you know, I tell you, I, what I do expect is I expect absolute um, intensity. Oh, absolutely. I expect neither one of these guys to back down whatsoever. I expect them to come out swinging. And, you know, it, it, you know, one of the things, and I want to set this up, we're going to be bringing these guys, and we're going to start our b- debate in just a few minutes. Um, but we're going to lay down some rules. We're going to let you guys know what to expect. The debate's going to last um, around 45 minutes, 40 to 45 minutes. It's going to be 99% these guys. This is why you're tuning in. If you're in the auto industry, the topic is, you know, we use the topic BDC, although, you know, it's it may not be what you think. So um, it's a buzzword right now. It's obviously important. There are manufacturers that are encouraging their dealerships to implement BDCs, it's almost mandating. Uh, so, you know, we're excited, and the industry is has their ear to the ground on this subject but what to expect in this debate we have two um 
consummate professionals, guys that are both successful in their own rights mm -hmm. and, and, and uh, tons of clients. And, um, and these gentlemen are going to come on here, and we're going to set it up. We're going to give them a chance in the beginning to uh, introduce themselves, and we're going to give them a chance to introduce uh, their companies, their, their, their history uh, in this space, what their automotive history and, and experience is. And then here's the, here's the caveat. Neither one of them know this, but I'm, I, I'm sure that they only could expect this. We're going to ask them in that opening, after they're done introducing themselves, to tell the listeners and us what they expect from this debate today, why they're most excited about this debate, because it's really about you that are listening. It's about you that are listening and what you can take away from this. So we're going to do that. Then we're going to flip um, a, a, a coin. And by the way, Mike, make sure we have a coin. Um, we're going to flip a coin. And this coin mm -hmm. is um, this coin phones is going to uh, have the phones are already calling in. We're <laughs> the, the, this coin is um, going to decide who goes first. And the winner of the coin toss gets to choose if they want to go first with the first question or defer that first question. And whoever goes first will also uh, go first on the closing arguments at the end so that they're not having the first and the last word. Um, so I'm going to jump to that. There will be closing arguments at the end. Um, which will be two minutes for each contestant to just kind of freelance in the end. And in the debate context and style in, in, in itself, we're going to have um, questions. Cribs is going to ask a question to one of the competing trainers. Then the other competing trainer will have a chance to respond. Then I will ask the second question to the uh, c other competing trainer, and likewise, and we'll repeat that down the path. And these so questions have been sealed away. So no one <laughs> knows what the questions are. <laughs> in the vault of Auto Dealer Live. <laughs> so that's how this is going to go down. We're going to start the debate in eight minutes. The debate will start at 345 Eastern Time in eight minutes. Um, we already have these guys on the phone. They're already locked and loaded. They'll be Skyped in, so you'll be able to watch the debate. Um, the questions are already sealed, so sorry if you're tweeting in. We want your questions. We want you to tweet your questions in because we're going to send these questions as follow-up questions uh, to uh, both Sean and Alan um, because these guys are obviously um, are able to respond to that. This is their, uh, this is their wheelhouse. Um, so in eight minutes we're going to go. So here's the thing, man. I want to, you know, um, I want to, um, I want to tell you, I'm, I appreciate you, man, as a co-host. I appreciate everything you've done. Thank you. And and uh, hold on, we got somebody calling in here for Absolutely. a second. Hold on. A second. Absolutely, go right ahead. This is Dave Villa. You're an auto dealer live. Who am I speaking with? This is Dave Villa. You're an auto dealer live. Who am I speaking with? Okay. Well, they hung up. After the debate starts, we will not be taking live calls. Um, so if anybody has anything, we'll try to get you on the air really quick. We have about seven minutes. Um, we have seven minutes until the debate starts. I'm excited. We're anticipating our largest uh, listening audience. Uh, if you're listening, we want to invite you back every Thursday to listen to Auto Dealer Live. It's every Thursday, 3.30 to 4.30 Eastern Time. And here's the thing, man. We have we, we this is a show for dealers by dealers. Um, you know, I'm I'm a CEO of an advertising and a company that deals in automotive dealers, but we don't talk about that on air. We're here. Uh, hold on, we have a call, and I'm going to go ahead and take a call live. This is Dave Villa, and this is Auto Dealer Live. You're on the air. We have about six minutes to the debate. Who am I talking with? Jim Ziegler. <laughs> Jim Ziegler, what's up, my friend? <laughs> well, you know I'm. I'm, I'm here in this debate, and these guys are two friends of mine. You know, it's, oh, yeah. it's two polar opposites. I wonder how it's going to go down. Man, I'll tell you what. If I wish I had a crystal ball at this time, Jim, because I've been wondering that for the last couple of weeks. And, and um, man, I tell you what, it's... Uh, you know, I told Cribs, I said, if I were in either one of their place, I'd probably, you know, I'd probably have a little bit of butterflies in my stomach right now because, you know, I'm, I'm amped up as the host. I can only imagine what these guys are juiced up for. Well, you know, Sean's on his soapbox, and of course, if he has to be on a soapbox, you wouldn't be able to see him. Mm. You know? <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, wow. You know, but, but I'll tell you what, both of these guys are brilliant. You know, all, all joking aside, it's, it ought to be, be interesting, and we've hyped the heck out of it, but um, this ought to be a pretty serious uh, educational event. I, I'm expecting that it will be. I really do. And Jim, you know, any, any, I, I mean this with all sincerity. I mean, you've been a guest on the show a few times, and I, we, we sincerely respect you and what you bring to the car business. And if anybody, anybody says that this should be interesting, I think that you saying that should hold some weight. 
Absolutely. I think the entire Alpha Dog tribe is in the audience. I've been really rounding up some people. Well, we appreciate that. We appreciate that. Hey, you know, um, something I want to throw out there because I know I have a few clients, my clients in Texas that are attending. Um, you have a mega conference that's coming up uh, in, in, in just a few days, I believe, next week, correct? Next week in Dallas, Hyatt Regency Hotel. I don't put my, my students in any flea bag hotels or uh, <laughs> right, right. other conferences. But uh, <laughs> no, Hyatt Regency, I mean, it's first class. It's right up there. Um, I've got 21 speakers on stage over Jeez. two and a half days, including myself and Sean V. Bradley. Um, T- Tammy LeBlue, who you well know, is going to be in, in the, on the stage. Yeah, Tammy yes. LeBlue. Matter of fact, I'm working on uh, one of my clients that actually works for the organization that um, that uh, uh, w- the, the big organization or, or where one of my clients that possibly will be attending uh, uh, um, works, and they actually spoke highly of her. She uh, she's incredible and has an incredible almost a business within a business there at Or Nissan. So, yep. um, so let me ask you this: If dealers are listening right now, I mean it's only a week away. I know that's short notice. Do you still have a couple slots that they want to get in? I've got I've got room. I mean we. We've, we anticipated a sellout, which we had, and I've got a big enough room where I can put additional people in it. It's, it's a single room format. Where we don't have breakout sessions where you have to choose the speaker. 21 speakers, a lot of information aimed at sales managers, general sales managers, general managers, anybody that has anything to do with variable operations. I mean, David Blazengame from Autoflex is speaking. That guy sells 4,000 high lines a year. Year, wow. an independent dealership, two hundred nineteen wow. million dollars in an independent. Wow, man, that's incredible. That's crazy. Wow, yeah, that's... you need to get him on the show, David Bless. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, if David, you're listening. You know, you heard Jim. We'd love to. We'd love to talk to you. Well, Jim, how does how does a dealer get how does a dealer get a hold of you? How do they find out about this? Simple. They need to do it quick. Ziegler. My name is Ziegler. Z I E I before E. Ziegler Superconference dot com. Ziegler Super Conference, so they can find out information. If you talk to Jim, tell him that you t- that you heard him on Auto Dealer Live. Uh, we we would appreciate that. And uh, man, oh, I tell yeah, you, dude, that, I, have you heard that Sean Bradley said that Alan Ram is being sucked down into the tar pits, wheezing his last wheezy gasp? <laughs> I I saw that on Twitter. <laughs> I saw that on Twitter. I. You know, I, I, uh, I, shh, I'm a referee. I tell you what, I cannot wait. I'm excited as a professional in this industry, man. I'm looking forward to being educated today and uh, absolutely cannot wait. Jim, thanks I, for taking my call, hey, Thanks guy. for calling in, Jim, and thanks for listening, man. I appreciate it. You are loved. Thank you, sir. That was Jim Ziegler, and I tell you what, uh, Jim, is, uh, Jim is awesome. 342. We're going to start in three minutes. We have them waiting in the wings right now. We were talking earlier, Cribs and I, <laughs> we were talking earlier about um, uh, about boxers because we're relating this to a, so much has been related to this about uh, in the boxing arena. And right now, you know that pre-fighter, that UFC, that pre-fight. Sometimes when the cameras and sometimes they're not allowed. I remember Mike Tyson; he would not allow a lot of times the cameras to go into the locker room. But if you could see the glimpse of the pictures that are out of the locker room, you see these fighters kind of sitting on a table. You know, they're just sitting there and they're so focused. Oh, yeah. You're so focused, and you know, there. I mean, it's to me, that's what I envision Sean V. Bradley and Alan Ram doing right now. Mm-hmm. You know, it's calm before the storm because they've got to go out and lay it on the mat. Oh, yeah. They're, they're, they're seeing it play out in their mind right. as they're waiting to go out. Absolutely. And, and you know, um, the, you know, something that I said earlier, and I, and I kind of want to say this because, you know, when you have this, when you have this drive that these guys have, don't expect listeners, listen, some of you, it's, it's almost like an election process. You know, mm-hmm. there's going to be those who never change their mind. There's going to be those who walk away thinking the same way they thought when they came in. This is not designed to change the masses' mind. This is designed to dialogue and get you thinking. But there's some dealers that are on the fence or some yeah. that are wondering, which way do I go? Legitimately, right now, entering into this space, we call BDC. They're saying, hey, which way do I go? And I think what's going to happen today is you're not going to see these guys waver. You, it's not like Sean or, or Alan are going to leave here going, mm-hmm. oh, you know what? I no longer believe the way I did. And mm-hmm. I said this earlier in a, in a video, but I want you to hear this because this, this is what these guys are made out of. Yeah. This is the backbone that they have. They don't go back in their corner drinking water like boxers do, you know, in the corner between rounds. They're going to go and they're going to be drinking their own Kool-Aid. Hey, Kool-Aid. 
Kool-Aid. You know what I mean by that? They're going to drink. Listen, they drink yeah. their Kool-Aid, Absolutely. ladies and gentlemen, and they that's what they believe. That's yeah. what they stand on. They're idologues. They believe what they believe what they believe. Yes. They'll, each of them will leave here today with that same belief. You know, mm-hmm. But like you said, the dealer who is on the edge of the seat, thing about BDCs, they look different in every single dealership. So dealers are still trying to figure out the best way to have their BD set up operationally and what are the best practices. Absolutely. Don't go anywhere. We're about a minute and a half away. The, 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 the trainers are making their way into the studio as we speak via Skype. So we're, we are literally we are literally a minute and a half away from bringing them on. Don't go anywhere. Um, if, uh, so, so, so I'm excited, though, to see the, the Twitter audience, and I'm excited to see the panel weigh in. Um, we're going to go ahead and, and, and let you guys in on a little secret. We mm-hmm. have, um, I mean, completely unbiased. Matter of fact, that the trainers do not even know who uh, these individuals are. We have dealer principals that are uh, not clients of either one of them. Uh, we've worked on this behind the scenes because we want to bring you, the listening audience, we want to bring you the the verdict. We want you, and again, you're going to have your own verdict. And, and just because three people do agree or disagree, but at the very end, we want you to hang with us. When this debate is over, there's going to be a 10-minute just extension to the show. We're calling it an after show. Mm-hmm. What is this after show? This after show is three dealer principals. We have John Marazzi. He's a dealer principal of the number one Honda store mm-hmm. on the west coast of Florida. He's in the top 40 of all Honda dealers in the United States of America. He ran for years Fort Myers Toyota. When he was in charge and at the helm of Fort Myers Toyota, it was one of the top Toyota stores in the nation and in Florida. They did 1,000 plus cars every month. This guy knows this stuff. John Marazzi is going to be with us um, live uh, at 4.30. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ross Bauer, he is a, a general manager for probably over t- uh, 15, 20 years. Uh, he's with Toyota. Ross is going to be with us at the end. We also have Jared Spencer. Jared is a general manager of Twin City Honda Nissan in Texas. These are three guys who, who are going to weigh in and be with us at the very end of the show to tell us, in their opinion, um, who won yes. and who won the show. Martin, real quick, brother. Yes, sir. How we doing? I'm doing all are right. Are ready for this thing? We're getting there. <laughs> All right. What's you want to hear trending? what's trending? I want to hear what's trending, and we're going to bring our guests on. All righty. All right. Thank you. Jason. Toyota fourth quarter earnings hit by U.S. settlement. World's largest automaker still manages record full-year profits. Toyota settlement with the federal government over unintended acceleration claims contributed to a 5% decline in fourth quarter net income, but the automaker still achieved record full-year profits. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration won't urge GM drivers to park recalled cars. GM hires former PR head Steve Harris to help with recall crisis. In automotive news from Washington, for more than 10 years, scores of General Motors engineers, inspectors, and other employers engaged in a deadly cover-up over an easily fixable ignition switch defect. An estimated 13 to 300 people lost their lives when their car suddenly shut off, disabling their power brakes and airbags. GM discovered the problem in 2001 with its Saturn Ion. According to documents, the company belatedly sent to the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. Though the defect was evident in other models, GM did not notify the Federal Safety Agency until 2006. The company then sent its dealers a service bulletin to look out for, but not recall the cars. Visteon, quarter one revenue up 7% as vehicle demand rises. Visteon, which is a division of General Motors Parts Department, reported a 7% rise in first quarter revenue as higher vehicle production boosted sales of its climate control products. And on what's trending today, Auto Dealer Live is bringing you Sean V. Bradley, Versus the Allen Ram. Here we go. Here we go. Solutions. It's on. That, my friend, is what's trending. Well, ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have on the phone right now joining us. We have Sean V. Bradley, uh, CEO of Dealer Synergy, and we have Allen Ram, CEO of uh, Proactive Training Solutions. Gentlemen, how are you today? I'm doing fine. Thank you. That's Allen. Sean, how are you, sir? Sean V. Bradley, are you with us? Oh, I'm doing great. 
I mean, I, I, <laughs> hey, Sean, Alan, I'm glad you guys are joining us. And we're going to jump right into this thing, man. I know we had a little issue with the Skype, but we have Alan and Sean on with us. And um, I'm going to flip. You know, my guys here, you think that they can get me a quarter, but I'm going to flip a freaking penny. Really, guys? I'm going to flip a penny. I guess it has a heads and tails. You know what? We're going to do this. We're going to, sh- we're, Sean, we'll let you call it in the air. So uh, I'm just going to say call it, and you just say heads or tails, and then uh, and we'll go from there. Call it. Heads. And it is spinning. It is spinning. It is spinning here, and it is heads. Heads it is. Heads it is. I'm showing it on the camera. Heads it is. Sean, would you like the first question? Or in, in, by choosing the first question, you get to obviously answer the first question. If you defer, then Alan gets the first question. However, whoever gets the first question also gets to go first. In the closing arguments, which means the person, uh, other person gets to go last. So we don't want the same person starting and ending the show. Would you like to answer the first question or go last? I'd like to go last. Okay. All right. Mr. Alan Ram, uh, we appreciate you. We'd like to start with you guys. Before we ask the first question, Sean, we'll go with you first. Just take a minute. Introduce yourself. And this is what I said on the air. I know you guys were, were trying to get on Skype and we uh, had some issues. So just in case you didn't hear it, this is the kind of ground rules we laid out for the listeners. Um, we we are um, we're going to give you guys each a minute in the beginning to introduce yourself, tell us the name of your company, and with regards to the your the experience in the auto business, just briefly tell us about that. And then here's the last thing I want both of you to end with, which I didn't speak to either one of you about, but our listeners wanted to hear this. What do you want to see accomplished? What do you want to see? Out of this debate today, Sean, we'll start with you, and then we'll give Alan that minute, and then we'll have uh, we'll go to the first question after that. Sean. Okay, I'm sorry. I thought Alan was going to go first. No, no, he's going to get the first question. You get to go first okay. on introduction. Okay, no problem. So again, Sean B. Bradley, CEO of Dealer Synergy. Um, I've been in the automotive industry for approximately 15 years. I have about five and a half years on the front lines. I worked in New Jersey at a Lincoln Mercury Monster dealership where I was a 30-car guy, averaged on the showroom, but I was like the one-man internet show but taking floor-ups. I left, went to Pine Belt um, Automotive in Tom's River, New Jersey, where I took a department from about 25 units to over 110 units. I left there, went to Cherry Hill. Uh, Nissan was already, um, they are doing about 40 units a month, took them to 95, 100. Mm-hmm. So after about five and a half years in the front lines, mm-hmm. I left to start Dealer Synergy. So for the last 10 years that I've owned Dealer Synergy, I've personally trained over 9,000 automotive sales professionals. And uh, again, I love automotive internet sales. NAD, as you mentioned, speaker, Franklin Covey, trainer. Uh, I have my own workshops called the Internet Sales 20 Group. What do you expect to get out of this? What do you you expect and plan? Uh, what, what, what What do you expect to get out of this today? What do you want to see accomplished today? You know what, the biggest thing is because I know that Alan has a different view um, on BDC than I do. I'd like for once to be able to articulate how to sell cars in 2014. It's not 1983 anymore. Okay. And I think a lot of the antiquated ways of selling cars and the old school philosophies need to be, you know, put right. to rest. We'll get to okay. that in the debate. But, Alan, we'll give you a shot to introduce yourself. Tell us the same, the same thing uh, about you. And then uh, tell us what you want to see out of this debate. And then we'll go with the first question. Wonderful. Thank you. Good afternoon, guys. You know, here's the, my name is Alan Ram. I'm president of Proactive Training Solutions. And what my company focuses on, focuses on is driving traffic and converting opportunities, both on the telephone and online. And the easy way to say it is we focus on everything that you want your people doing at a dealership when they're not with a customer to get with a customer. And my training's endorsed, endorsed by both NADA as well as NCM, and I've spoken at uh, the initial two best training day, days ever. And I've been doing this, started selling cars in 1985, a while ago, that was a few semesters ago, right out of the United States Marine Corps. Mm-hmm. I sold cars, I was a lease manager, a new car manager, ended up as general sales manager of what at the time was one of the top three Nissan dealerships in the country. So, and in 1991, we started doing this. I founded Proactive Training Solutions, and since then, the rest is history. What do you Some want people to... would say ancient history, huh? What do, you want to, what do you want to see today, Alan, most, most importantly out of this debate? Well, you know, more, once you get past all the noise and the talk, I think this, this is a very important conversation to have, okay? Because no one's going to agree. Either you're going to pick Sean's side or you're going to pick my side, but no one's going to agree with both of us. And, 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 again, as I see more and more dealerships going towards this BDC model, 
where they're, they're saying, hey, our salespeople cannot take sales calls. Our, our salespeople cannot handle Internet leads. We're going to have specific telephone and Internet people to do that. You know, I, I, I think that I've, I've got a problem with that. Okay, so we're gonna, we're that's gonna get what in. I want to accomplish. Okay, All right, we're going to get into those questions. <laughs> and in the format for the questions, guys, um, Cribs is going to have the first question. Yeah. He is going to ask Alan. Uh, Sean, you have a chance to respond to that. And then um, when I flip to the next question, then I'm going to ask Sean that next question, the second question first. And, Alan, you have a chance to respond to that. And then we'll go so on okay. and so forth. So we'll go back-to-back uh, questions so that the, uh, so that it can go in order, so that I'm not asking Alan or Sean the same or uh, vice versa every question. So we're going to start with Mr. Cribs. And uh, go ahead, Dave. Okay. This question is going to be for Alan. And, Alan, I'm going to ask this. In terms of a BDC setup within a dealership, as far as the personnel, what should that look like? Should it be, you know, those A to Z salespeople that, that, that start and end the sale with a delivery? Or should it be strictly appointment setters that then turn the client over to the salesperson once they arrive? Or should it be some sort of combination of both of those? Well, definitely, when it comes to handling the inbound sales calls, this is definitely not appointment centers. I, I, and, and let me just say this. I love BDCs, but I think that dealerships need to BDC intelligently. And, and frankly, a lot of these BDCs that you see in the industry today, they're just mm-hmm. indicative of a, what's the, there's something buzzing. Yeah, there is. Um, I don't know. I'm getting it's some not, news. It's, it's not here. It's, uh, it's somebody's phone or something is buzzing. I don't know what it is. Okay, it's off yeah, now. So, mm-hmm. Okay, so anyway, in, in any event, a lot of these BDCs today, I, I think they're indicative of a systematic failure of training at the dealership level. And, and here, here's what I'm saying. When it comes to, and I'm talking specifically, and, I, and I'll talk if, later on about what I consider a good BDC, but, you know, here, here are my issues. When you say that salespeople should not be the one handling the sales calls or Internet leads, what you're saying is that the people that we're hiring in Chicago, let's say, to, be, to, to sell BMWs, yeah, that, while, while we trust them to handle a customer on a lot, for whatever reason, it blows their flipping mind to talk to a customer on the phone. I'm not, I'm not buying that. Secondly, I'll say this. It takes every, and I've trained a lot of BDC people. It takes every minute as long to properly, and that, that's the operative word there is properly, train a BDC representative to take a sales call as it does take a salesperson to train a salesperson. And on top of that, it actually takes longer. Why? Because they don't know the product. They don't know the inventory. And the third thing, and I think this is huge from an expense, from an expense standpoint, in this day and age, and we've all spoken a lot of 20 groups, you know, when, when dealers are talking about expense this and expense that, we're talking about a second group of people to do what the first group should be doing. In the meantime, we've got five salespeople standing out by the front door for three hours talking about who should take Johnny Manziel tonight. So the bottom line is this. Train your people to do the jobs you train them to do. Sean. Okay. Sean? Are you yes, with us? Sir. Okay, that, Sean, that buzzing is Sean, kind of distracting. Yeah, we're going to try to take That's care of that. There's it's not a, on, it's not yeah, it, it, it appears to maybe be on one of the ends over there. So just, uh, Sean, uh, if you can check uh, just to make sure there's no phone that's within the shouting distance of the speakers. It's just like a text um, message. Or yeah. Go ahead. Um, Sean, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to serve you up that same question. When it comes to uh, BDC, a BDC department, the way it should look personnel-wise, would it consist of A to Z salespeople that, that uh, take that initial uh, phone call all the way to the point of sale and delivery? Should it be strictly appointment setters that uh, get the customer in for that appointment, then hand them off to the salesperson, or some sort of combination of the both? Okay, first, I want to make myself crystal clear. I do not believe in BDC. I think BDC is the most degraded acronym in the entire automotive industry. This is why Mercedes-Benz manufacturer failed, why countless dealerships fail after fail, because what a BDC is supposed to be, to answer your question, we need to define BDC. It's a department that proactively generates traffic to the dealership. That could be internet sales, inbound phone-ups. That could be service conversions, unsold showroom traffic, data mining campaign management. That's a BDC. I don't believe in BDC. I actually sell more dealers off of BDC. What I build are internet departments that take phone-ups. So I'll answer that question based on an internet department that takes phone-ups. I completely disagree with Alan as far as having the salespeople do it. Here's why. Math. There's eight ways that a showroom salesperson could sell an automobile. You've got walk-ins, feedbacks, internet phone-ups. You've got referrals, prior customers, service conversions, and prospecting. I'm at a dealership right now. If you have 500 or 800 leads that are coming through, 
that are the internet department, how in the world is a salesperson going to be able to handle all eight ways to engage and then chase down and follow up the right way, the right way all these internet leads? So we believe in having appointment setters. These are not, you know, um, liabilities. I was shocked that Alan just said that this is an extra expense. Human resources are never expensive in an organization. That is the greatest asset that any organization can have is their people. So I'd much rather have more people that are an asset that are trained properly than big gorillas or other old school type, you know, ridiculous tactics. So I definitely believe having appointment setters from open to close in shifts, specifically, let's say 9 to 6 and 11 to 8 from shifts from open to close, they're trained to, uh, to basically make outbound phone calls and inbound phone calls. They're able to receive convert. Uh, from the phone call to the appointment to the show to the sale. Here's a math figure. It's fact. You only have an 11 to 14 percent connection ratio on the phones. So if I'm a salesperson, let's just do some basic math. If they are going to turn around and call, which they're never going to be able to do, 120 people in a day, okay? Guess what that means? They're only going to connect with about 11 to 14 percent. You're looking at about 14 to 17 bodies in a day. That's it. So what really needs to happen is how could you use the most productive people the most productive way? So I definitely believe that the salespeople should be involved, but not as the primary source for taking the inbound phone-ups or all of the onslaught of Internet leads. I think you should have a team of people that are, are trained appointment setters. They're trained in outbound phone call process, inbound phone call process qualification, how to identify, meet, and exceed a prospect's expectations. The goal is to engage with the prospect on the phone, whether it's internet or a phone up, qualify them, identify their wants, wishes, expectations, meet them, identify the unique value package proposition of that dealership, set the damn appointment by selling the appointment, not asking for the appointment, and then ongoing. I believe in building customer factories. Leads, whether they're internet leads or phone ups, are going to go to a team of highly trained phone sales professionals and they're going to work those leads, convert them to appointments, and they're going to convert those appointments to, to deals. Alan, so it's like a customer factory. We're going to let the, I mean, in here, because we're getting a lot of feedback on this one point, I'm going to let the gloves come off here a little bit and let you guys just debate on this for a moment. And, and so, Alan, I'm going to let you rebuttal and then let you guys just debate on this for, for a few minutes. So first up, are we saying that salespeople are too busy, Sean, to handle the inbound sales call and Internet leads? Because if you walk into dealerships, you know, what do you see salespeople doing? You know, typically, there, and there are, there are a number of different ways for a salesperson to make a living, obviously, repeats, referrals, be back, and all the rest. But typically, you see salespeople waiting for customers, waiting for phone calls, okay? Salespeople, they know the inventory. And I've heard a lot of these BDC people, and I've shopped a lot of them over the years. I shop salespeople, and I shop BDC people. And the BDC people do not sound any better when you, have, when, when you call them up than the salespeople. If you ask them the gross domestic, uh, if you ask them the, the towing capacity on a Lexus Sport Utility, you may as well be asking them the gross domestic product of Bolivia. They don't know the product. They don't know the inventory. So what, what, how do you answer that? I think it all boils, and let me just say this, I think it all boils down to training our sales staff. Whoever you train, whether it be the BDC rep or the sales staff, it all boils down to training. So we've got salespeople at the dealership, at the dealership level. Why don't we just train them to do their jobs? Why are we, why are we saying that salespeople can't handle these phone calls or the Internet leads? Can, can I respond? Absolutely. Yep. Go right ahead. Okay, the first question um, I'm going to go to is a question about, you know, what do you see at dealerships? Well, Alan, I don't know about your clients, but my clients are extremely productive. We train our salespeople to not have to wait or fall asleep in demos. So that's the first response. The second thing would be this, is that as far as should we not train the salespeople, of course train the salespeople, but I don't know if you've ever heard of the book, The Seven Habits of High Effective People, but the third habit is put first things first. You've got to be careful of distractions, disguises, opportunities. There's a lot of shit that we could do. The reality is what is the most powerful thing that we could do to get the biggest return of our fiscal uh, investment as well as our time investment? And I'm not saying at all. I'm a salesperson. I'm a 30-car guy, so I'm not saying that salespeople can't answer a phone up. What I'm saying is what is the best use of their time? In my opinion, to be able to turn on and have appointment setters from open to close in shifts, Come on, Alan, you've been doing this long enough. You've been doing this longer than I have. It's a numbers game. The more people they call, the more people they get on the phone. The more people they get on the phone, the more appointments, more confirmations, more shows, more sales. It pencils out. 
So to answer your question directly, no, I'm not saying you shouldn't train the salespeople. They should absolutely have, you know, phone skills training. They should definitely have advanced phone skills training. I just don't think the best use of a showroom salesperson's time is to take phone ups. I think you should have a department that is completely, you know, immersed in just inbound, outbound that's not going to cherry pick. Their whole protocol is to set the appointment. That's just my opinion. Okay. Can I uh, follow up on that? Sure, sure. Okay, let me let me ask you this, Sean. And we're talking. I'm talking specifically about having appointment setters handle the inbound sales calls and and appointment setters to handle the internet leads. That's what we're discussing here, right, Sean? Yes, sir. Specifically, we're talking about appointment setters. Yes. Okay. So here here's my question to you, and you're better with the statistics than I am. And first off, what is the source of 11 to 14 percent connection ratio on phone calls? What is the source of that well, statistic? I'll turn around and source dealer synergy. Again, right now, I've personally been doing this for 10 years, and I've got this number locked down to a science. We have literally... 11 to 14 percent. 11 to 14 percent. So let me be specific. Let's talk about the appointment center. And this is a legit number. You might be able to use it for your dealers. Help them out. Because what happens is this. If you are not doing a product presentation, demo driver delivery, if you're sitting in front of a computer and you're making outbound phone calls, literally you're only going to receive a connection of about 11 to 14 percent and i'm not talking about auto dialers or predictive dialers i'm talking about just manually dialing the phone calls you will on average engage about 11 to 14 percent of the people the majority of people are going to be voicemail messages not answers bought elsewhere etc and if it's lower than 11 percent it might be a scheduling issue or might be other problem but it's about an 11 to 14 percent connection ratio Okay, I'm not, I'm not, I'm personally not buying that statistic. 11, 14%, if you're getting customer cell phone numbers, you've got a much higher connection ratio than that. I'm going to, I'm going to say that first off. But anyway, what percentage of transactions initially, and what, what, what's the statistic? What percentage of transactions start out on the internet? Specifically, 92 to 99%. 92% of people that are not Highline, 99% of Highline customers go online before they step foot into the dealership. It's between a 45 and 90 day window period. Next question. Okay. Well, a member of my staff bought this, this quote to my attention, a uh, clip that you did from your uh, last Auto Dealer Live interview. And, and, and I listened to it to, to confirm that this was the quote. And here, here's what you said. Salespeople yes. need to take responsibility for their own career and future. And then, and then you followed it up with that, and, and that, that, that's wonderful. That's, I agree 100%. And you said, car sales is my own business, and I'm in control of my own destiny. I'm sure you, you remember saying that, right? 100%. I believe that. Okay, good. Then let me ask you this. If I'm a salesperson at a dealership, and almost every transaction, you say 92, 99%, okay, I'll take it. Every transaction starts online and, and, has, and ends up on the phone, typically. Isn't having someone else in charge of conversion of those opportunities depriving me of responsibility as well as uh, really depriving me of my own responsibility as well as my opportunity to earn? And, and I'll give you a second part to that question. And because we are all salespeople here. If I'm a professional salesperson in the audience today, please tell me, if I want to take responsibility, tell me why I should go work at a dealership that does not allow me to take sales calls or Internet leads. Can I answer now? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. We're letting you guys freelance. Okay, this, this, yeah. this sounds like you're an Obama fan, like entitlement. Here's the reality here, okay? I said that a salesperson is an entrepreneur. They should, they should look at car sales like their own business. Absolutely, that doesn't mean if they're their own business, they're going to rely on what the dealership is spending tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars a month to generate. Again, when you ask me the question of what is the percentage of people that go online before they step into the dealership, the number is 92 to 99%. Those are not all Internet email leads or Internet phone ups. So I want you not to turn on and confuse the audience. Even though 92 to 99 percent of Americans go online, that doesn't mean that they're going to submit an email or submit a phone up. What that means is that those are people that are walking through your door. So they are going to benefit from the 92 to 99 percent because the majority of them are just going to walk into the dealership or they're going to see some type of ad, autotradercars.com, whatever it is online, and go into the dealership. That's the first thing. Now, you said, what is a salesperson supposed to do? I'm not trying to deprive anybody anything. What I'm trying to do is maximize the efficiency and the profitability for the dealership. So if I was a salesperson, what I would focus on is what I could control. Dr. Covey calls it the circle of influence versus circle of control. What could I influence? First of all, I would get myself a website. I would turn around and drive traffic to my own website. 
I would generate my own internet leads. And that's if you're going to quote me from the last Audio Live, use the other clip when I turned around and said that a salesperson should think of themselves as their own internet department, their own BDC, their own phone call department. They shouldn't be on the Obama plan and always depend on the dealership to turn around and supply them stuff. The dealer's got the responsibility, just like the manufacturer has the responsibility, as does the individual salesperson. So they are in control of driving and generating their own traffic, as well as reacting to the leads that are coming through the showroom floor and be back. Work in the service drive, work in the referrals, work in the prior customers, work in the OEM, GM hand raisers, and everything else in between. There is an abundance of opportunity for a dealership uh, professional to engage and convert and make money. Matter of fact, Tamerly Blue is, uh, you know, one of the top Nissan sales consultants in the country, one of Jim Ziggler's protégés. $400,000 this woman's making, not my clients. I'm not using one of my clients. I'm, I'm buying her by the rules. She has nothing to do with my company, but this is a female that was the number two Nissan sales consultant, and she didn't just live off of, you know, the phone up. She diversified the way that she sold cars. So that's my response. I got, I'm going to jump. I got a question here. I want to kind of stay in the same vein. And this question, um, who got the first question? <laughs> Alan. All right, so Alan, I'm going to ask Sean, Sean this this question then, and then Alan, you'll have a chance to respond, and and then we'll just let you guys, k- you know, keep keep going here. And and um, the question the question is, and it and it, it came in uh, earlier. We put these together, but the question is, um, with regards to th- with regards to uh, taking a salesperson versus an appointment setter, or who should take the call, if if a customer calls in and has specific questions which customers do about inventory or about, you know, uh, price on vehicle, about, you know, what they have in stock and how much and so forth. Uh, how should that be handled? Should that be handled by a salesperson? Should that be handled by an appointment setter? And then the second part of that question is, uh, if handled by someone that's not in sales, um, would they have the opportunity, would they lose sales or have the potential of losing sales based on lack of uh, knowledge um, or the ability to convert. Who gets that one? Sean, and then Alan, you get a chance to respond. Okay, so to answer your question specifically, I want to also remind you again, because I'm not a BDC person, not a big fan of it. The vast majority of my departments are internet sales departments that receive phone ups or take phone ups. Okay. So it's predominantly internet sales, <clears throat> and they also take all the inbound phone ups. So for me, I don't just have a bunch of random, you know, kids or people that don't know anything about the car business taking, you know, uh, millions of dollars worth of potential sales and don't know what they're doing. Usually the structure you're going to have, whether it's two, four, six, eight, however many appointment setters, there's going to be a manager. My rule is always with our dealer synergy clients that you need to have somebody that has profound automotive sales experience. Whether that person is a sales manager or a GSM level person, I don't want some internet nerd or some, you know, call center person that doesn't have the ability to engage a prospect. The majority of my philosophy is that the call center people are going to be doing a tremendous amount of follow-up. However, if they've got the prospect on the phone through proper training, which I do agree with Alan said, but the proper training with word tracks, outbound phone call process, inbound phone call process, the proper uh, qualification techniques, they're going to be able to ascertain. But to answer your question specifically, if somebody has a specific question on a truck, like for example, I think I'm a good car guy, but I'm not a big truck guy. So if somebody asked me a question about a truck and had the tow capacity, if I didn't have access to that information right there, there has to be somebody that has to be in that room, in that department, not in the office next door, that's able to do an instant TO. On top of that, the other aspect of this is I don't have my department staff with the coordinators and just one director. I do have salespeople that are in the department to offset the, the, the scheduling. So this is going to make sense in a second. So, for example, I mentioned that our, our shifts are 9 to 6 and 11 to 8. So what happens is, let's just say there's like six people in the department. That means that any given day, half the department's not going to be there from 9 to 11, and half the department's not going to be there from uh, 6 to 8. So what happens is, I am totally okay of using salespeople to offshoot the, um, the schedule. And while there's salespeople in there, if the coordinator, we call them a coordinators or appointment setters, have any issue, they can't overcome a question or objection, they can't answer the question fluidly, I don't want them to drop it or mishandle it, it's going to get to to either the internet director or to one of the internet sales consultants that are inside the department. 
But I got to tell you, I mean, again, I've been doing this for 10 years at, at Dealer Synergy. We have very, very little problem teaching and training appointment setters how to engage and how to answer questions and how to qualify prospects. But you're absolutely right. There's sometimes people want specific things that might be over the knowledge of an appointment setter, but that's the same thing as the showroom floor. Let me just correlate, and I'll pass it back to Alan. It's just like a showroom floor. We have a road to the sale. And what happens when a salesperson can't spot a car? National average, Alan, for you, NADA says, it's about an 18 to 20% closing ratio. That's with a live body in front of you. But what do we say? We should believe in 100% TO protocol. So all of our internet departments, or BDCs if you guys want to call them that, they're staffed with that initiative and that protocol that it's a 100% TO process. The coordinators are like frontline salespeople. If they cannot overcome something or they're not able to make the appointment, there's an initial instant TO, 100% TO protocol. Alan? Let me ask you this. When would, it's 2014, when would a customer not have a specific question? When would, a, what, are they just calling for directions? They all have a specific question. They all want to know how much, how much is it, what would my payments be, information about the product. What, what, so when would they not, information about the inventory, when does a customer not have a specific question? It's like me, if you call a doctor, and we've all had this experience before, you call the doctor's office, and you want to speak to your doctor, and you get the receptionist. Well, the doctor's busy, the doctor's with patients right now, but, but can I help you? Well, no, I really want to speak to the doctor. Well, she's very, she's just busy, she's tied up. I'll let her know your concern, and, you know, but, but it might be later on today, or it might not be today before she can call you back. Yeah, I really want to talk to the doctor. How relieved are you when the doctor calls you back? Why? Because I know I'm eventually probably going to have to come in, but I want to talk to the doctor. I want to talk to the person that knows. If we're going to, if we're saying that an escalation, the better service is going to come from a salesperson, because the salesperson, at the end of the day, the salesperson knows the product, they know the inventory. And, and we're making a big differentiation here. We're, we're saying these internet leads, like they're different, okay? These people that call in as a, as a result of the internet are different. It's 2014. Fifteen years ago, they were different. These days, everything's a phone call, everything's an internet lead. Train your people to handle the jobs you hired them to do. If I am a salesperson and a big part of my living, and I, and I agree with Sean that you know I should be generating repeat business, referral business, having the website, all, running my own Craigslist ads, I agree with all that. Okay, But I also, at the end of the day, I want the opportunity to handle sales calls. I want the opportunity to handle Internet leads. And this acronym BDC... Okay, most of my dealership clients do not have BDCs. I'm, you know, the, the, as we were discussing this, the, to me this was a conversation well, we about did, hey, who we handles did, inter- we didn't, inbound sales Alan, calls. Quick. Is, it, is it salespeople or... Alan, we didn't tell you guys. We, we didn't tell you guys that. We just we just wanted to. I guess it's probably a good time to tell you. We didn't mean BDC debate between the two of you guys. Meaning business development center. We meant it the, like the big dingling contest. I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> you, guys, you guys are gonna come up here, man, and have a pissing contest. I'm, so that's what BDC it, stood it, for today. But go ahead, Alan. And and, and, <laughs> and I just said that on air. Before We're on the internet, baby. <laughs> before Alan goes on, I just want to clarify one thing too. You know, we throw the term BDC around there. Uh, like like Sean said, he just wants to get rid of BDC. <laughs> Let's agree. We can throw that out right now what we are talking about are leads lead generation in and outbound phone calls that's what we're talking about if it falls under bdc so be it but that's what we're talking about dealing with internet and phone leads go ahead alan it's a salesperson's job to take and i i I strongly believe this it's a salesperson's job to take the inbound sales call it's a salesperson's job again they're all internet leads these days it's not like i said it's not 15 years ago where one out of three people had had a computer everybody has a computer as a salesperson i should know how to convert an internet lead from online to phone call to customer in the showroom that's, now, when, I, when we say BDC, and again, this acronym is, oh, tends to be overused, here's what I think appointment setters are great for. Because a lot of de- some dealerships do have a version of a BDC. And, and here's what I think appointment setters are good for. I, I th- I'm a huge fan, and I don't know how Sean feels about this, with service appointment setters. I, absolutely. Handling inbound calls to the service department, making outbound calls. I, I've discussed that before with Jeff Cowan, who's 
in my opinion, the best service trainer in the in the industry, and he's a fan of that as well, handling inbound and outbound service calls, but also following up unsold customers. I think that's a huge opportunity because 39%, and that's, that's a statistic, a real statistic, 39% of customers that are surveyed that come into a dealership and walk out without buying a car say that the reason that they would not come back to that specific dealership is because they didn't like the, the salesperson for whatever reason. Too tall, too short, smelled like smoke, made an inappropriate comment. They don't like the salesperson. So we tell the salespeople, hey, follow up all your customers. Well, knowing salespeople as well as I do, I know that if they weren't feeling the love, they're not going to call this customer back. And, and the customer, if they do call the customer back, certainly isn't going to say, you know, we didn't like you. They won't tell the salesperson, but they will tell someone else. That's a great function for a B DC, a client service specialist, an appointment setter, whatever you want. That and service are two that I that I would start with. But if I'm a professional salesperson, I want the opportunity to take the sales call to make that conversion. I know the product, I know the inventory. Okay, uh, and I should know how to handle a, call, yeah. a sales call. Okay, Sean, you want to respond? Go ahead. Okay, to answer because it was a while ago, Alan, you had a, a good question. I believe that. Sales is about control. If you can control the conversation, you said, uh, I believe the question was something to the fact that, you know, who calls without a specific question? I got to tell you, a ton of people do. They try and call and ask really basic <laughs> questions. Like, oh, I was interested in buying this car. I was looking at the Honda Accord. Or I was looking at a new, I was looking at a pre-owned car. I saw this in there. So, again, what we train our people is to first gain control of the conversation. And, again, if it's about availability, I'm going to use something basic. This is not advanced. This is basic. Mr. Customer, that vehicle is definitely available. Other than availability, what else is important to you in deciding where you're going to purchase your vehicle? I'm further qualifying. So our strategy on the phone is to qualify the prospect. They don't all call in, I want to know what the flux capacitor dimensions are. They just don't do that. And i got to tell you, I get a ton of our people, our clients, to actually engage phone-ups or Internet phone calls or Internet leads. And they're able to, with proper process of dealer synergy, get these people to come in without giving them a price, without being invasive, without being old school or shady, and they freaking love it. Now, let me go over a couple other pieces of detail. You ask about sourcing. I'm going to give you another one. Harvard Business School. You can verify this on Google, okay? It says that there's science communication. Alan, I've seen one of your videos where you actually talk about the same thing. There's a science communication. 55% of communication is visual perception, body language. 38% is sound and inflection. Only 7% is text of the words we use. Our whole strategy is email sells the phone call, phone call sells the appointment, and the appointment builds the relationship, product presentation, demo drive delivery. All we're doing is basically segregating. It's one team. Just like you have a, a football team. You've got an offensive, defensive, and you've got special teams. I am not taking anything away from salespeople. What we're doing is we are a allowing a section of the team of the internet coordinators to basically from open to close without stopping, without stopping, pound the phones. I had a question for you, Alan, uh, okay, you can't answer. Sean? Sean, I'm not, Sean, I'm going to have to stop you there for a second. We're going. We have time for one one minute final question before closing arguments, and and this is this is the question, and I'm going to address Alan wow. first. I'm going to address Alan first, um, and then on, Sean will have a chance to respond. On, a, and then on an inbound call, on an inbound call, a cold internet lead, whatever you want to call it, whether you have a salesperson or an appointment setter, wh basically what I want to know: Do they need to use a hook? in order to get that person in, it, for example, an incentive to get that person in the door instead of just relying on the loyalty of making an appointment. Do we need a hook? Additional savings, gas card, oil change, whatever that might look like. What do you think? Yeah, ab absolutely you do. And, and let's talk about a, a customer-centric approach. And, and when I ask that question to Sean, as far as, you know, what, which of those questions, which questions aren't specific that a customer would call on, all the questions I think he cited were specific questions that the customer has. I think when we're, when we're, as we're discussing this, what, let's think through this process. When the customer comes in, they're not going to talk to the person they talked to on the phone. They're going to end up talking to a salesperson. So basically they're talking, in a lot of cases, to a telemarketer. We're, we end up playing a job 
giant game of telephone. And and when we we talk a great game in this industry about CSI and customer service, when did selling not become about creating rapport with a customer, showing an interest in what the customer is looking for, and having an intelligent conversation? And, and according to new, numerous studies, and I don't even need to cite a source on this, I, we know this is true, and I don't think Sean would disagree with this. What do customers hate? What do customers say they hate about the buying process? They hate being passed around from salesperson to closer to Knuckles McGraw to finance. In Sean's scenario, aren't we just starting to pass them around earlier? That, that's what we're doing. If we are truly concerned with the customer's experience, it's an open and shut case. The customer has already told us what they want. Okay, Sean. Sean. Okay, so to answer your, your question, do we need to turn have a hook? Absolutely not. I completely disagree with Alan. Here's what we need. We need to clearly articulate what is different and better about our dealership than anybody else. Again, all these Mickey Mouse things of oil changes and contests and all that stuff, don't get me wrong, that has some value, but nothing will speak louder than what is different and better about your organization, your value package proposition. Folks, come on, everybody listen to this, please. Tweet what I'm about to say to you here. It's about building value. The whole road to sale, the, the whole purpose is to build value before you talk to customers. That's why we do a product presentation and a demo drive. So when you're on the phone call, you need to make sure that you articulate what you do differently and better than your competition. You don't need monkey uh, little tricks and stuff like that. You need to just be professional and articulate what is different and better about what you offer than anybody else. Boom. Okay. Well, guys, and we're going to give you guys, we have, if you can see the clock on there, we have literally five minutes left in the show. We're letting you guys take it all the way out. Um, and we're going to start closing remarks. Um, Alan, you had the first question. So uh, you're going to get the uh, chance to go first here. So Sean's going to get the last word. He won the coin toss. But I want I want to, and I didn't get a chance to ask this question, but I want to see if somehow you guys have the opportunity to freelance. You don't even have to answer this question, but um, let me see that questionnaire on that sheet real quick. There's a question that I, that I had marked or from earlier um, regarding piggybacking guys on really what looks like the fundamental difference you guys have uh, with regards to, you know, who should take the call. You know, something that came up as a question when we were doing the research on this is commission. You know, does the internet department, or having an internet department, Sean, and we this into your closing arguments, guys, cut into the salesperson's commission or vice versa? How, how does a dealer handle that? You know, I know that's a dy dynamic that some of the dealers that I've spoke to, you know, have a question on how to handle. Alan, you get the first chance to have a couple of minutes of closing remarks, and Sean, then you close the show out. Okay, go ahead. So, was that was that my question? I mean, it was it was a question. It was I didn't it, I'm, really honestly. I don't have a question. I, have, I don't have I don't have the right to ask the question, so to speak. I wanted to throw that in if we had more time, but that was just something I thought was really pressing because I wanted to, you know, uh, I wanted to get that in. But honestly, you get two minutes to say whatever you want, and then Sean does as well. Okay, it's and again, what we're talking about here is customers reaching out to us. Are we going to? insert a middleman, a middle person into the into the process. As a customer, who do I want to talk to? And I and I just mentioned this a minute ago. I want to talk to the person I'm going to be talking to when I get there. And it, when it comes to setting, it, it's about, it is about creating rapport. It is about showing an interest in what the customer wants. And it's just too easy to prey on the misconception of some dealers that this stuff can just not be trained to their salespeople. But the problem is that a lot of the things that dealers have bought over the years have not necessarily been training. And training your people is work. Okay? It's like working out. We all know that getting in shape is about exercising and eating right. And, and, and that's what losing weight and, and, and getting in shape is about. But yet there are still those people that are on TV at 2 a.m. looking for the infomercial with a magic pill. Train your people to do the jobs that you hired them to do. If I'm a salesperson and I'm going to be – I'm – my responsibility is selling this customer when they get there. I want to also be in charge of the conversion. I want to handle the inbound sales call. The level, and, and here's the bottom line. Teach the skill set required to communicate intelligently with a customer does not necessarily require the level of, specializa of specialization that some of, us, that, that some of us are creating here. If I'm a salesperson, I should be handling inbound sales calls, and I am perfectly capable of handling Internet leads. And I don't think that Sean would work necessarily, but despite all the, the things about the eight, you know, and there are plenty of sources of business as a salesperson, I still want to be taking sales calls. I want to be handling Internet leads. And as a professional salesperson, I would not work at a place 
that did not allow me to do so. Sean, you get your closing remarks. Yeah, absolutely. First and foremost, I want to just let everybody know that, um, you know, that I really actually like Alan Ram, and I have no beef with him. Me and David from Auto Daily Live and Alan, you know, we just wanted to get a lot of, you know, viewers on here. So I have a tremendous amount of respect to anybody, and I mean anybody that is about bettering automotive dealerships and teaching professionals how to be better, achieve more, and do more. So first and foremost, I wanted to just thank Alan for the debate. And uh, with that being said, I want to just kind of go off of that, is that there's always different ways to do things. I don't think for a second that my way is the only way. As a matter of fact, when I go into dealerships, I say, listen, this is the, the, the version that you paid for, but there's probably other ways that you could do it similar and have the same success or maybe even higher. So what dealers need to do listening to this is qualify themselves, identify their individual situation, their strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, their culture, their goals, their aspirations, and then, cho- and then choose wisely what system's going to work for you. So with that being said, I'll answer your question um, about the pay plans. For me, appointment setters should be compensated on a different pay plan. Just like, you know, if I'm a showroom salesperson, i got to do a TO uh, to my manager, my GSM or my desk guy is not going to turn around and take my commission. It's the same thing. What we recommend is that they're compensated on probably like an hourly or base, uh, approximately, depending on your region, 350 to $400 a week salary, maybe more, a dollar for an appointment made, 15 for a show, and then 25 for delivery. What you want to do is you want to compensate your coordinators or appointment setters on what they have control over. Uh, again, it might seem like the 25 or the, or the highest number is for the appointment that's <coughs> sold, but believe it or not, you're going to have double the amount of shows and actually have sales. So, again, what I would say to a dealership that's trying to put a pencil to this is that you could offset your cost. And you could do that by instituting a hard pack on the Internet deals or by, let's say, charging back the deal. Now, before anybody freaks out, let me explain something. I'm not saying invest a bunch of money in people and leads and keep selling the same amount of cars. You know, again, obviously, if you're going to, you know, create a team of Internet, you know, professionals, coordinators, buy a bunch of leads, you have to sell a hell of a lot more cars. But if you articulate it the right way with the right consultant, you project plan, like Cubby says, begin with the end result in mind, it will definitely pencil out. So, again, thank you, everybody, from Auto Dealer Live and for Alan Ram for the debate. And uh, you guys can reach me at uh, Sean B. Bradley on Twitter. Or um, my cell phone number is all over the internet, so feel free to ask me any questions if you if I left you guys hanging. And how do we reach you, Alan? Uh, here, at my office, and thank you as well, Sean. And and again, there's uh, I think this is a conversation that needed to be had, and uh, I, I've I've certainly enjoyed it, and especially the lead up. And and uh, my phone was dead within about uh, three hours of waking up this morning from Twitter notifications. But uh, anyway, it's been, it's, been a, it's been a great conversation, and, uh, and you can reach me at my office. is 866-996-4665 in lovely Scottsdale, Arizona. Awesome. Guys, we'll, we appreciate you guys coming on the air, and uh, Absolutely. stay tuned. Um, appreciate you, Sean. Appreciate you, Alan. Thank you very much. Thank you as Thank well. You. Stay tuned, guys. Right now, we're not even gonna um, we're not gonna have any 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 delay here, any wait. We're gonna have about a five minute after show, and uh, producers already has uh, three three managers on the phone. Uh, owners, we're gonna bring them on, and we're gonna have a quick dialogue. We're gonna let them talk about it. These are guys that aren't clients, totally um, biased, except for the fact that they run dealerships. And we're gonna get their feedback, and we're gonna have them on the spot uh, declare who they felt um, argued the most convincing argument. And uh, man, what an awesome show! I wish it was longer. I, I, you know, I knew we would, we had twelve questions. I think we got two. Um, yeah. in, in reality, two three, three three questions uh, down. Um, and you know what? But you know what? This was really not about you and I. It wasn't about the show. It was about just bringing dialogue. I don't know who the heck won this. Yeah. I want to sh- uh, another shout out. Uh, 10x Grant Cardone. 10x Rule. We had an autograph copy um, that we're going to give away to. The lucky uh, producer that gets to count the tweet, <laughs> count the tweets, and uh, and you don't count, you don't count. All right, so we got him on the phone. Everybody on? Okay, hold awesome. on. Thank you. And guys, we want to appreciate you for again listening. We have on the phone. We have. I want to p- first of all thank these three gentlemen for coming on with us. And uh, Martin, if you turn the music down there, um, I got. We have John Marazzi, uh, dealer principal of Brandon Honda. Uh, John uh, runs the. Um, one of the fastest growing Honda stores in the nation, in the top 40 uh, in the United States, uh, number one in the west coast of Florida. Um, I've known him for, for, uh, of, of, for several years. He ran Fort Myers Toyota, uh, over 1,000 cars a month, um, it, one, of the, it's crazy. one of the top Toyota stores um, through his time running that store. John, I appreciate you being with us. We have 
uh, Jared Spencer, general manager of Twin City, Nissan, and Honda um, in Texas. And then we have Ross Bauer. Ross uh, has been a general manager for t probably 20 years and uh, with uh, one of the biggest Toyota stores at the time in, in uh, the Bay Area. Guys, I want to thank you for being on the show with us. Are we have all three of you? Yes, yes. Yeah. Thank you, guys. And we're just gonna we're gonna let you guys just talk. I mean, John, I want to start with you. And um, you know, we, we we really did a lot of thinking and, and put a lot of thought into who we can bring on the show. Um, that you know that because these guys impact a lot of people and their clients and so forth. And uh, we wanted to find some guys who are who who would objectively listen to it and and really tell us in their opinion. Um, you know who they felt like had the most convincing argument. John, in your opinion, what stood out? And then you know, just uh, if if you don't mind, declare who you felt like had the most convincing argument, and then uh, maybe why. And then we'll go to Ross, and then we'll go to Jared. All right, I think uh, I think Sean did a good job um, expressing his <laughs> thoughts. Um, he he made it clear that um, he believes in flexibility as far as how to set up the, the department and that many different systems work. Um, but the, the, the thing that Sean doesn't get that most people that have tried doing what he's doing, it's another layer of expense. And it's the adage that we're going to train somebody to be able to communicate with the customer because we can't get our salespeople to do that. Um, and customers are just going to arbitrarily call in and lay down for an appointment. I think Alan was spot on when he says that the customers in 2014, they want information, they want price, they want a lease payment, they want to know what their trades were. And when they're talking to someone that's, that's not going to give them that information, uh, I, I, it's going to be a problem because all they're going to do is get frustrated and have to repeat themselves to a second person on that TO. Um, I've worked pretty much all three systems, cradle to grave, appointment setters, and hybrid. Um, I think, uh, I think, so to sum it up, I, I think that Sean articulated his points better, but I think Alan is correct with his view that the modern salesman has to be able to handle it all, which is, uh, you know, an internet lead and a sales call. Okay. All right. Well, then, John, so you, so you, then you declare o overall, um, as, as, as far as the most convincing argument, you, you're, you're saying Alan won the debate on that level. I would give it to Alan. Okay. I appreciate that. Ross, Thank you, I appreciate you being with us, and I know you're extremely busy as well. And, and um, what's your thoughts on that? I know you, 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 know, you have a lot to, lot to say about this uh, particular subject. I, uh, I agree a lot with what uh, John Marazzi just said. Uh, I think Sean makes a very convincing case. Um, I believe that he's got the right idea because the reality is that it is difficult to change the culture that we have in the car business with the existing sales structure that we have. Um, but at the end of the day, I believe that Alan has the right approach. Um, I guess this is why they both have successful companies, because they're both right. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that Alan, and I agree with John, that uh, you know everybody's an internet lead, everybody's a phone up, everybody's a social media lead. There are no more walk-ins in the, the sense of 1995 or 2000. Uh, I believe that Alan has got the right idea. And uh, it needs to be flexible depending on the dealership and the metro. Um, Brandon Hahn is a gigantic metro store, um, you know, best car guy in the world running at John Marazzi. That doesn't mean that what he's doing is going to work in, you know, ABC Kansas that sells 35 cars a month. So I think there needs to be an approach that embraces both, but I tend to agree with Alan Moore. Okay. Okay, well, we appreciate it, Ross. Thank so you, then, Ross. All right, Ross Bauer. And then uh, Jared Spencer, I, all the way from uh, Port Arthur. What, but, oh, you're in Port Arthur, Texas, right? Yeah, Port Arthur, Texas. South Arthur, Texas. Te Texas. When South you look at Texas and Louisiana and the Gulf, we're more in the water than on land. Okay. Well. But you know what? The, the last, little, last little comment made was there are different types of dealerships. You know, what works in, you know, at Brandon Honda and works here and work, works at, you know, Kansas, up in Kansas, is, is a little bit different. Both guys made made a great point, but I think what they what they missed is they were articulating the the idealistic setting. You know, Bradley had uh, had, had a lot of good points, and he, he articulated that well. But what he didn't realize is, yes, all these people are internet customers now. Okay, ideally, we'd love to have a call center that can handle these calls that are coming in and that have solid knowledge of what's going on, information based selling which is, you know, Ram is talking about information-based selling. Hey, the salesperson 
should be held accountable and to know all this stuff. But unfortunately, we've all been with those dealers. We all know those salespersons. You know, most of those salespeople are not people that are listening to this conversation right now, okay, because they're not taking the initiative. But most salespeople in the business are not initiative-driven, okay? So they're not able to handle that call. Let's train a team that's able to handle and feel the sales call properly. But what Brad doesn't see is most BDCs, they're not trained properly. Most sales staff are not trained well, properly. He would argue. I, he I would really, argue. That, go ahead. He would yeah, argue probably he, that he, he. He would definitely argue that. Well, he would argue that hire his company to come in and train. Him. Exactly. He would argue that his people so, are sure. trained. So. Sure. And you know what? We sent we sent people to, to, to Cardone. We have you know Ramp got a great online training par, uh, process, but sales staff don't follow it, and it's been proven that they don't stick with it. Okay. You know this. He, uh, Bradley said eleven to fourteen percent. Um customer retention are able to get a hold of those customers. Well, like Ram said, then he's screwing up if they're only getting 11 to 14%. I've been in internet sales. I've done that, you know, years ago when internet sales was the person, hey, who wants to do with this? Deal with this. Okay? 11 to 14%, that is a horrible contact ratio, especially in the day of cell phones. Send them a text message. Send them a video message. I mean, if they're not <coughs> aware of people like Elise Kephart who's doing this, sure. call Elise Kephart at Sunset Honda. You know, sure. We've had ask her what her we had Elise on the show, her. and they're all familiar with they're her. They're all yeah. familiar with. We had her on the yeah. show last week, or last month. But let me ask you this, Jared. I mean, then call call a winner. I mean, obviously, no one's perfect on that. But in your your opinion, as a dealer <laughs> listening, I mean, who made the most convincing argument in in, in your call? Yeah. I, I give it to Ram. Okay. All right. Well, anybody else want to add anything? Yeah. I appreciate you guys. I know yeah, you're busy. I, John? Yeah, I'll tell you. You know, a couple things that people don't realize about setting up coordinators and appointment setters. Number one, you have you're trying to hire people for ten dollars an hour. Uh, you know, I'm not going to mention. I I dealt with one of the companies that specializes in this, and they tell you ten dollars an hour plus bonuses. Well, you can't hire people in a metro market for that. So now you're up at twelve, thirteen dollars an hour, mm -hmm. and you throw bonuses in there. And then the kind of people you're going to hire for ten, eleven, twelve, they don't show up for work. They get a job for fifty cents more. Mm -hmm. They leave you. So all the work you put in and train them to learn the product, learn the dealership, learn the culture, learn the unique selling product positions of the store go out the window. So you have tremendous amount of turnover issues, tremendous amount of HR problems to run the ads, to interview the people. The, the best thing, in my opinion, that could be done is you sub out your unsold sales calls and you sub out your unsold uh, or your uh, service follow-up. And there's plenty of companies that do that. You have E-Lead, you have DME, you have several org organizations that you could pay a dollar to a dollar twenty-five a call. They make three contacts. It's done. You know it's done. It's done by a professional call center. That, in my opinion, I'm not saying those those phone calls shouldn't be made, and I don't disagree that getting salespeople to make those phone calls is, is not a tough issue because it is. But pay the buck and a quarter and get it done and done professionally and sub it out. And you have and and your expense is probably twenty five percent of trying to do it yourself. Well said, well, gentlemen. I appreciate you being on the show. I, mm -hmm. I and I, I know you guys are extremely busy. I appreciate you listening. Yes, and uh, and coming on and weighing in on this. It means extremely a lot to me. Thank you, John. Thank you, Ross. Right, and guys. thank you, Jared. You guys have a great thank day. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you. much, thank you, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. you, guys. You heard it there. There were three guys that um, listened to the show. Uh, general managers, um, uh, different 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 uh, segments, different size stores. Um, in their opinion, it was an awesome debate. In my opinion, um, I think that, um, like they said, um, I think that both both of them brought in in uh, uh, a compelling argument. Mm -hmm. um, who do you think won? And that's what we want to hear. Twitter's blowing up right now. Mike, make sure you tweet out. John's on Twitter at John Marazzi. Tweet out at John Marazzi. Tweet out his decision. Uh, Ross Bauer, uh, find out if he's on Twitter. If not, just you know, tweet out his and Jared's uh, response. Let's get your way in. Who do mm -hmm. you think won the debate? Tweet at Auto Dealer Live. Hashtag Thriller with Villa. Um, hashtag uh, Auto Dealer Live. Give us your feedback. If you have questions, if you have follow-up questions and you want, listen, if you'd like to see a part two, honestly, I feel like the debate maybe wasn't even, uh, it wasn't long enough. So, um, hey, we'd love to invite Mr. Alan Ram and Sean B. Bradley back um, because there's maybe some unfinished business, maybe some things they listen back to. So you guys have a welcome invitation. Um, you know, Grant Cardone already mm -hmm. said, you know, I don't know, he already said it was like crumbs, crumbs, crumbs on the floor. I don't know, man. <laughs> I don't know. 
Uh, Grant, 10x, man. 10, 10x this appointment. 10x this show. Yeah. Man. Come on. Come on, Grant. Debate, debate somebody. Yeah. Pick the winner, Grant. Pick the winner and, and, let, and, let, and let's go. Yeah. I don't know if we got to get Donald Trump to debate you or what. I mean, I don't, I, you know, I know that, uh, you know, it's just us lowly folks over here, but I'm just kidding. Hey, man, listen, thank you for listening. We had a great time. Uh, come back next week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.